Hello again! This video will focus on the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, depending on uh, the translation of the Bible that you're using. And I just wrote <laughs> like really quick this little sheet of notes. So hopefully this is helpful. It'll be, again, an overview of the book, Welcome to the Library at uh, the base in Lakeside, Montana. Um, so first of all, this book, it is so necessary for our culture today. It is focusing on sex, on God's intention for sex, and it's something that our, uh, our world has a lot of uh, voices speaking into, and we actually need to get God's voice to be the one um, that directs our sexual ethic and our desire and our navigating of the desire that we have as people. Um, so this book was really fun to teach to a young audience. The majority of my students are in their uh, like lower 20s, um, which made it interesting because most of them were not married. So you have to be careful with how descriptive you get in uh, offering interpretations for the book. But really amazing book. Uh, we need God's perspective on sex. And I personally am really partial to this book because it was actually something that played a pivotal role in me feeling called to marriage. Um, when I did my SBS in South Africa, I didn't want to get married. I don't want to be distracted from the Lord and take all that time to invest in relationships, all that. I was like, not for me. Um, but when I read this book, I actually felt convicted by the Lord that this was a desire and it was a desire that I was um, kind of like putting down so that I could be holy and, and seek after God. And I found that he actually wanted to meet me in this desire and reveal himself through marriage in my life. Uh, so I'm really grateful for this book and the application it's brought in my own life. Um, but Song of Songs, it is all about um, the beauty and the value of exclusivity in marriage. Uh, sex is to be had between one man and one woman, a husband and a wife, and um, it's a good gift from God. There's, there's a right time, there's a right place to pursue it. And we'll see throughout the book, there's this refrain, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And, and so this concept of uh, it's not for everyone to go and have sex. It's not for any time. It's not for um, with any any specific, like, it's not for just anyone. It's actually for one specific person, the one that you are in covenant commitment with. Um, so that is like, in a nutshell, what this book is about. Sex is beautiful if it is pursued within the context of a covenant marriage, which is the context that the Bible and, and the Lord um, prescribes for his people. So that's like the, the general foundation of the book. Um, it's Poetry, uh, highly, highly um, based on imagery. It's just so many senses are appealed to, like sight, smell, taste, all of that. Um, touch especially. So this book is is poetry and it's supposed to be read as poetry. Hebrew poetry um, is quite terse. It's pretty to the point, um, but also has parallelism where um, one line will be followed by the next line that either um, further develops it or says the same thing or comes against it. Um, and... Yeah, I think those are those are probably the easiest ways to describe Hebrew poetry. But if you have more questions, feel free to uh, send me a message. I would love to speak into that more. Um, but this book is actually highly debated with its historical background. So, like I said, the title is Song of Solomon. Um, of there, that, that preposition is not really understood um, which interpretation to take of that. It could be... Um, it's written by Solomon, it's written to Solomon, it's written about Solomon, it's written in the nature of Solomon. Um, I take the interpretation that it's written in the nature of Solomon. So the Solomonic era has a high influence over the imagery in this book, um, that that feeling of splendor of, wow, the, the groom and the um, and the bride, they are the king and queen of this book. Like the, the whole wedding is just built around them. Um, so I think that imagery of kingship speaks into how we can interpret this book. Um, but the nature of this book, it, it speaks into the beauty and the value of exclusivity in marriage. And we know from Solomon's life, he had, um, I think it was 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's in 1 Kings 11. And towards the end of his life, all these wives led him away from the Lord. So some people will say Solomon wrote it. And then at the end of his life, he wrote at the end of his life when he was like regretting that he had married all these women, um, going against Deuteronomy 17, like God's uh, will for the king um, to not have many wives. But I think 1 Kings 11 makes it pretty clear to us at the end of his life, Solomon was actually going away from the Lord because of his wives. So I don't think he would have written this at the end of his life in regret. Um, to me, it sounds more like a rebuke of Solomon. Um, sorry, the sun just came out and it's in my glasses. Um, so authorship is highly debated. Um, but I think if you interpret it as this is something that's happening in the time period of Solomon, I think that'll help. Um, also, what's up for debate is how to interpret this book. Some people will take an allegorical approach, which essentially um, removes the concept of sex from the book. 
which I, I don't think is a very helpful way to approach the book. It's quite deductive, um, but it's really interesting. This was actually the mandated form of interpretation for the Song of Solomon by an early church council in 550 AD. And the reason for that um, was because the the Greek mindset of dualism had actually reached pretty far into the early church. Um, and part of dual, so dualism, the there's a separation between body and spirit. So spirit is good, body is bad. You can't actually... Um, like, you don't encounter God in your body, but in, in spiritual things. And it led to asceticism, which is um, deny yourself. Deny yourself of pleasure, of feeling good. Um, because if you pursue what is gratifying to the flesh, then you are denying um, the spirit. So pretty much that led to don't pursue sex. It was actually uh, seen as honorable for abstinence to be found even in the context of marriage. Um, so really interesting, the, the Greek perspective leading to interpretations that would actually um, rule out anything sexual from this book. So people who take an allegorical approach would say that this is referring to um, God and Israel or Jesus and the church. And it's it's pretty far removed from the historical context that it was written, especially to say Jesus and the church. Um, but even with God and Israel, there's, there's no hinting in the text that it is an allegory. And we see allegories throughout uh, other books in the Bible, Ezekiel, especially Hosea, um, but it, it states quite clear that this is an allegory and it even gives clues for interpretation. Um, the Song of Songs doesn't doesn't say it's an allegory. Um, I think it's actually, you, you really get into murky water if you, um, if you do interpret this allegorically because when you get to those passages that are very explicit sexually and you're, you're kind of imposing that upon your relationship with God, that gets really... Um, dangerous, I would say. Um, we see quite clearly in Leviticus 15 and 18, um, God's removal of sex from worship. Like he does not want people to be having sex to worship him in the temples. He does not want, um, children to be sacrificed for him. Like he, he removes, uh, sex from worship. And I think that's, uh, that should be the precedent we take when we're interpreting Song of Songs is actually, um, the law that God gave Israel in Leviticus. So, Maybe it's because I'm partial to Leviticus. I taught it earlier this year as well. Um, but I think it's quite clear an allegorical interpretation of this book is um, a little dangerous. It's interesting, though, in a lot of our music today, well, not a lot, there are several songs that sing the Song of Solomon with an allegorical interpretation. So I, I just think it's interesting how, yeah, how we see it throughout throughout our, even our church today. Um so allegory is one approach. Drama, some people say this was written um, to be acted out. It's a play. Uh, I, I don't think that's really a helpful way to interpret this book because there aren't um, like there aren't directions for how to transition scenes and there's not a clear indication of who is speaking when. Um, and then there, there becomes a debate of how many characters are in this book. And um, I, reading it, it seems like there's a lot of missing information if it was a drama. Um, the form of interpretation that I personally prefer is literal. So taking the, the text at its, uh, at its value, what is it saying? Um, this is expressing the delight between a man and a woman um, in having sex. And I, I think when we actually look at the book that way, it's so informative to us of God's um, perspective on sex. And that's really helpful because our world, I mean, I already mentioned this, but our world speaks so much into um, sexual ethic and, and actually... Um, I think to, in a detrimental way. So to have God speak into sex, I think is amazing. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing our father won't talk to us about. And, and I think we need to hear that. Um, and then final form of interpretation would be typological. Um, I think this is actually a pretty reasonable form of interpretation as well. Um, type meaning there's one thing taking the form of another. Um, I think if you, so people will look at this typologically and say, this informs us of our, our relationship with God. Um, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, like an allegory, um, but it is to teach us about how we can know God loves us and we can love him back. Um, if you take a typological approach, I think what would be helpful is to recognize the type as the covenant of marriage, not necessarily the type being the man and the woman in the book. Because um, again, when you get to sexual passages, um, it's really challenging to, to have that inform our walk with the Lord. Um, but if you look at the type of the covenant of marriage, I think that actually is really le legitimate. Um, when we see the beauty of exclusivity, like we are to worship one God. Um, when we see the delight that is found in relationship with each other and fellowship, like we delight in the Lord um, and he delights in us. I think there's there's a lot to be said about the security of covenant. Those kinds of things we can see with a typological approach. Um, but to look at the couple themselves as the type between the Lord and his people, I don't think that's going to be a helpful way to interpret. But 
you go about interpreting it as you feel led by the Lord. I think it's really interesting to approach this book devotionally versus studiously. Um, I find that I, I get a bit more typological when I'm just meditating on the book and when I'm teaching it, I'm like, oh no, this is what this means. And, it, and I find myself a bit more literal. So be curious if you have any input on that. Um, and then the structure of the book, some people will say that it is chronologically organized. So at the beginning of the book, um, the couple is engaged and then they get married and then they have, um, life after being married. So, um, the, the honeymoon you could say, and then maybe some struggles they have in marriage and, and actually how they go about dealing with that. Um, people who don't like this approach would say that it advocates for premarital sex because chapter two seems a bit explicit sexually. Um, so either it's not chronological or you explain the, the um, intimate parts earlier on in the book as um, the couple daydreaming and not actually consummating their marriage. Um, regardless of how you interpret it, everyone agrees the, the center of the book is 3, 6 to 5, 1, and that is um, the wedding and the consummation. And actually in the, in the Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 1, that is the very center of the book. Um, so most people recognize there is a chiasm happening. Um, it's not a full true chiasm, but you'll see there are mirrored things all throughout the book. So like um, delighting in each other at the Shulamite's vineyard. And then um, there's dreams that are happening on either side of the wedding. And there's affirmation happening on both sides of it as well. So there are some repeated things, but it's not a true chiasm. Um, but the structure definitely does point to the centerpiece being the wedding and the consummation of their marriage, um, which I think plays into the main idea of this book. Wow, this is a book celebrating um, sex in marriage. And yeah, so I think if you're, if you're trying to approach the book structurally, you can see it as chronological. You can also see it um, as not chronological. Either way, I think you're going to get a lot out of um, tracing the, the repetitions throughout the book. Um, sorry, I'm trying to speed up a little bit. Um, ultimately, this book has a lot of advice for relationships. Um, the importance of, af of affirmation in platonic relationships as well. Like we see insecurity gets pushed to the side when um, the couple affirms one another. Um, at the opening of the book, the woman's like, don't look at me, I'm so dark, I've been working out in the vineyards. Um, so she's a laborer, she's not super wealthy, she's been tending to her family's vineyards and not to her own body, um, to their relationship. And then the man comes back and just affirms her. And you see um, you see her open up with affirmation. And I think it's a beautiful thing um, that we can do for our friends and our spouses alike. Um, I love in, in 215 when I was talking about catch the foxes that would spoil the vineyard. So vineyard being their relationship, catch the foxes. Don't let unforgiveness or um, wandering eyes or just any number of things, finances come in between you guys and, and your your relationship. Um, so I think it's also cool. Um, it says catch us the foxes. You can tell that there's um, the couple is receiving input from other people. Um, they they are not isolated in their relationship. They have counselors. Um, I think this advocates for like premarital counselors and marriage counselors and friends and bridesmaids who know um, who, you, who you guys are as a couple and, and what you're walking through. Um, yeah, so don't go about it alone. Yes, have an exclusive marriage relationship, but within that, have accountability and have people who can pray for you and, and fight for you, fight with you. Um, I think it's important to be friends with the person that you're married to. This book speaks into, this is my beloved and this is my friend. Like they enjoy each other. They, they long for each other when they're separate. They, um, they have things in common and, and they're very, very quick to affirm what they love about each other. And I think that's really, um, a great precedent for us in relationships. Um, I think this book also in, in kind of rebuking Solomon in a little ways, um, or in a few ways, um, I think it does show that love is so much more valuable, especially chapter eight, you'll see kind of this like call to application. Um, but love is so much more valuable than money and um, all the things the, the world will chase after. So wealth, fame, and lots of lovers. Um, we see all three of those pushed back against by this book, um, which I think is really powerful for us to, to recognize we're not missing out when we have one person that we're committed to and um, seeking to love and to please them is actually a, a higher a higher goal than seeking wealth and fame and, and lots of lovers. So, uh, yeah, something that I thought was a really, really beneficial practice for my students and for myself as well, um, was to actually look at what is the sexual ethic of our world and how does this book come against it? So real quick to, to wrap up, I'm going to share a few of those things. Um, the world would say instant gratification, do what feels good to you and do it now. Sex is about you feeling good. Um, so go like experiment, 
get better with practice. Um, you'll actually serve your, your spouse by um, being somebody who's good at having sex. Those are things that our world says. This book, oh my goodness, comes so against that. Um, talks about how uh, you actually are, are to seek the the pleasure of someone else in the context of having sex, that it's actually um, a, a privilege to um, bring pleasure to your spouse. And the exclusivity of this relationship, they were not looking around to other people. Um, the, his one, his dove was better than a thousand. So um, I think it's, it's something that we can glean from this book, Song of Songs. Wow, it's actually a beautiful gift to give somebody that they would be my one person that I pursue intimately. Um, I think as well, the the world has a huge pornography addiction and industry. Um, we talked a lot about this actually with our students, um, but what would it look like to, um, to actually like guard our hearts and our minds against um, images and against media that would lead us astray? So just challenging my students to, if they're struggling with porn, like seek help, get prayer, repent, but also change your habits. Like if you can't be alone, with a computer, don't be alone with a computer. Um, if you need to always have your screen facing someone else, always have it open where someone could see, like just really practical things. Um, masturbation as well, talking about like, okay, what are your triggers? When are you more susceptible um, to doing that? Like if you need to take cold showers in the morning instead of warm showers at night, do that. So just getting really practical, like how do we guard our sexuality and how do we actually stay pure and give the gift of purity to our spouses um, or our one spouse. Uh, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, and I think another thing that we we hear from the world a lot is that boundaries kill desire, that there's actual um, freedom in being promiscuous, but this book really affirms to us there is sexual freedom and sexual holiness, and um, just got to encourage my students to really chase after holiness and share from my own testimony of what a gift it was to be a virgin marrying a virgin and to not have to like question, okay, like, does Caleb know so much more than I do? And am I, like, unprepared for this? And um, am I not as good as someone else that he's had sex with? Like, that kind of thing. Those were not questions. And that was such a such a gift that we got to give each other. Um, so this is starting to run long. I'm going to end it here. But if you have any questions, feel free to respond to this. Um, I attach some reflection questions at the end of the email. So I hope that you get to talk with the Lord about this, pray into this. Um, how has your sexual ethic been shaped by the world, by the purity culture maybe? Like, is there a lot of shame that you associate with sex that you can't really talk about it, that you um, maybe feel guilty in having sexual desire or pursuing it? Um, lots of lots of really good conversations can come up between you and others, but also you and the Lord as you read this book. So God bless you. I hope you enjoy this video.